Welcome to our video, Japan and the World. The topic for this time is, Independent Thinking. What do India's state elections mean for Narendra Modi? I would like to focus on the Independent Thinking by Chatham House. A weekly international affairs podcast hosted by the director Bronwyn Maddox, in conversation with leading policymakers, journalists and Chatham House experts providing insight on the latest international issues. Bronwyn Maddox is joined this week by writer and academic Nishtha Gautam to discuss what India's state elections mean ahead of the 2024 general election. Joining them in the studio are Professor Louise Tillin from King's College London and Senior Research Fellow Chietij Bajpi. Hello and welcome to Independent Thinking, the weekly podcast from Chatham House. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, the director. This week, we're going back to India as we said we would, and we're going to talk about the outcome of the recent state elections. With the general election just months away, Narendra Modi and his party, the BJP, won quite a few of the five state elections whose results were announced this week. And that seems to confirm the BJP's control over what has been called the Hindu heartlands in the country. But is that the full story? We're going to suggest not. And we'll take a closer look at what happened and why it matters to India and indeed to the world beyond its largest democracy. We're also going to examine larger questions about India's democracy and ask how the country has changed after a decade of rule by Narendra Modi and the BJP, and specifically the impact of the type of Hindu nationalism espoused by his governments. Well, I've got a great group of people here. Joining me down the line from New Delhi is Nishta Gautam. Welcome to the podcast, Nishta. Thank you so much, Bronwyn. Great. It's a chance for us to continue the conversation we began over breakfast in <laughs> Delhi about a month ago. Absolutely. Joining me also this week is Professor Louise Tillin from King's College London's India Institute. Welcome. Thank you. Great. And you were telling me that you're just finishing a book on India's welfare regime. Yes, that's right. Great. When? <laughs> I'm just indexing it right now, so it should be out next that year. That really is the last yes. pages. Yeah. And I'm delighted we've got with us again Chitaj Bajpayee, the Senior Research Fellow for South Asia here at Chatham House, writing on all things about this for us. Hi, Bronwyn. Good to be back. Really good to have you all here. Well, let's start with talking about what this week's results mean for Modi. And I wonder... Louise, if you could take us into this, which states went to the polls and what the results were. Sure. So we've just had this week the results of five state elections, um, which is a large batch. And these are pivotal polls because they're the, they're the last batch of elections before next year's general elections in India. So they're always seen as crucial bellwether states. We've got a mixture of states, three states in India's Hindi-speaking heartland, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, neighbouring states, and Rajasthan. The fourth state was a southern state, southern state of Telangana, formerly part of Andhra Pradesh. A new state was created only in 2014. The fifth was a smaller northeastern state called Mizoram. And the results are a mixed picture. Of course, the headline which has really grabbed attention has been the BJP's success. Its sweep of those, Hind those major Hindi heartland states, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan. Most people expected the BJP would probably win one of those states. It was less certain that they would win all three. So... And I think we're going to get into this in more detail. The results there obviously raise a lot of questions about the state of play ahead of the general elections, the condition of the Congress Party, the electoral strategy that the Congress Party pursued in those elections, and really how we understand the outcomes of Indian elections now, obviously in a very changed environment since the consolidation of power by the Modi-led BJP in 2014. The fourth state was that of Telangana, which was actually a good news story for the Congress Party. No one really expected the Congress Party to win this state. It had been held since the state's creation by the regional party, the Telen what used to be called the Telangana Rashtri Samiti, relatively recently renamed itself the Bharatya Rashtri Samiti in a bid to present itself or to, to uh, cross the line between its status as a regional party and a national party. The Congress Party defeated the BRS in its homeland, only homeland state. Um, and so this was a really good news story for the Congress Party. And in Mizoram, we saw the victory of a regional party against the BJP-led NDA alliance. So very different stories playing out in different parts of India, which remind us that India remains a very 
pluralistic electoral scene with state-specific issues determining outcomes in different parts of the country. That doesn't mean to say national issues aren't important, though. We'll come on to the national issues. But uh, Nishta, what did you make of these results and this, this picture? Were you surprised? Absolutely not. And you may uh, recall our conversation last month in New Delhi, how I was, uh, you know, basically <laughs> expressing my disappointment with, with many of my peers, you know, who, who always tend to, uh, to take on the mantle of, um, of an astrologer and say that, okay, you know, this is what is going to happen uh, in the next elections and hava badal rahi hai, you know, this is, this is the favorite uh, catchphrase of all the apologists or political analysts, which l- roughly translates it says, you know, winds are a changing. For whom? Really? So it did not come as a surprise to me at all. And Chitij and I were actually texting each other on the day of the counting said that, you know, it's, it's actually uh, going along the predicted lines. You know, it's very easy to say, oh, uh, you know, with Rahul's, uh, Rahul Gandhi's uh, Bharat Joro Yatra, Congress is picking up momentum and this is what is happening. And I would uh, uh, disagree with Louise here that it uh, it was actually a big win or a big positive for Telangana because that one state was actually along um, the predicted lines as well because BRS was so, so unpopular in the last one year. And BJP does not really have a footprint in Telangana. Um, even though, you know, when you, when you go back to the genesis of the state, yes, BJP had a role to play there, but uh, there, was, there was a lot of local sort of politics at play there. That's very helpful. So n- not surprising, could have been foreseen, even, even though it widely it wasn't. No. Chitich, what does this mean and what does it mean in particular for Modi? Yeah, sure. So I think, uh, you know, a lot of people have, uh, tend to frame these, these state elections uh, as the semifinals for next year's general elections. And I don't think that's entirely accurate. Uh, there's no direct correlation between state and national elections. The best example of this uh, is what we saw happen back in 2018, where the BJP lost these same three state elections and then went on to uh, to win the parliamentary elections. Uh, and in 2003, it actually won these same three state elections, then went on to lose the parliamentary elections in 2004. So I think it's important not to read too much into the state election outcomes. On the other hand, let me say, I mean, one of the reasons we decided to, to do this podcast and um, when we were last doing a India podcast was because of the significance of these state elections, perhaps for showing whether Modi's power might be constrained, even even if he went, it goes on to win the general election. And I was just wondering what you felt that we could read into this, perhaps very little. Well, I think, I mean, uh, there are several uh, you know important implications, uh, you know, beyond next year's parliamentary elections. These state elections also matter because they determine the composition of the upper house of parliament, the Rajya Sabha, uh, where the BJP is yet to secure uh, a majority. Uh, And these these states aren't insignificant states. They count for 83 uh, uh, seats within the 543-seat Lok Sabha. So they are important elections. I think the BJP is definitely in a stronger position going into 2024 uh, than it was going into the previous election in 2019. The economy is in better shape, as we've discussed. It's won these elections, which it lost the last time around. Uh, So I think the BJP is definitely in a stronger position, but I wouldn't put uh, a direct correlation between state election outcomes and the national election. Louise, you're nodding and you were talking about the complexity of this picture. <laughs> um, how would you describe the significance of these these results? Well, at an event last week at Chatham House asked about the potential significance of the outcome, I said these, uh, these election results will be more important for the Congress Party than they are for the BJP. Pretty much whatever happens, and we saw this in 2018, the BJP will be able to ride out the outcome of these elections. What I think we've seen for Congress is a multi-part story. The Congress Party vote hasn't collapsed. And that's very important to remember. The BJP won, for instance, the state, state of Rajasthan on a very narrow margin of less than 2%. And the Congress Party actually increased its vote share on 2018. So this is not a story of Congress Party collapse, but it is a story of the Congress Party's difficulty in a first-past-the-post system of converting its vote share, which in the state of Rajasthan was almost 40%, and wasn't too much less than that in, in Madhya Pradesh and in, in Chhattisgarh, into seats. And this is a consequence of, of India's voting system, much like our own in the UK. Um, the winner has a great advantage when it comes to forming forming the state assembly. Congress vote share hasn't collapsed. What we have seen in these states is that there that this and, and we're only just getting the post poll data, so we we don't know the full picture in all the states yet. But from what we've seen so far, the Congress Party has managed to hold on, even gain among lower class, lower caste communities. The BJP has consolidated its standing amongst 
upper caste, dominant caste communities. So the, this is fairly classic fault lines, and it's what we'd expect to see in the Hindi heartland. So the, the story is, is not clear-cut in terms of what it means for the Congress. What it, what it certainly will mean, though, is that the politics of the India alliance, the main opposition alliance, which had been starting to take shape in the months before these elections, will become much more complicated because the Congress party like no longer looks... Complicated, do, do you mean um, unsuccessful? I mean, Potentially, yes. yes. Yeah. The, Congress, the Congress party refused to enter into alliances with its coalition partners in that alliance before these state elections. And so now agreeing the seat sharing arrangement, which these parties had promised to do ahead of the Lok Sabra polls, is going to look even more difficult than it already was. Nisha, just take us into that predicament of the opposition. Months and months there have been already about uh, talking about seat sharing and whether that could be got together ahead of the general election. What do you make of the state of the opposition and, and particularly of the Congress party now? Well, actually, a Congress party uh, only has itself to blame. I have always maintained that when it comes to state elections, Congress party always tends to overplay its hand. Whenever there is a there is a question of uh, seat sharing, whether it is in Uttar Pradesh or um, elsewhere, and uh, because I come from Uttar Pradesh, so I follow the, the the politics very very closely there, there's always this this sense of uh, this grandeur, which which is totally unfounded on uh, the party's ability to win elections, and there are these these gestures, and that is going to be the death of of this very ambitious alliance because why would the regional party uh, play a second fiddle to a party that is you know I I agree that there is uh, the vote share is intact but it is not translating into seats so why would you want to carry that kind of dead weight Congress party always wants to uh, to contest on more seats that it can win or possibly even mount a credible opposition. So it's a, it's a very, very strange situation. I don't know who to blame because it's very easy to 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 put. Well, I'm, go- I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you, actually, because um, I love your 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 phrase about the sense of grandeur of the of the Congress party. And I wondered whether you thought the the Gandhi dynasty took some responsibility for that and for what you're suggesting is a really lack of reality about the current state of the party. Absolutely. I think the Gandhis are to, to blame and Ram Guha has, <laughs> has said it more succinctly and more angrily, I, I, I dare say, in um, his last interview. And uh, he was, was pretty, pretty clear how this duo of Rahul Gandhi and Priyanka Gandhi and all their coterie have actually brought Congress to this day where the party has, uh, has absolutely no credibility as an, uh, even as a local alliance partner. And you're talking... Yeah. As an election winning machine. Absolutely. They are no election winning machine. And also they play the similar kind of politics that the BJP plays, uh, Bronwyn. And I think that's very important. But they cannot win an election playing that kind of politics. So Chudaj, does Modi face, looking ahead to next year's election, really any significant opposition? Frankly, I would say no, but but uh, you know the, you know the uh, BJP led uh, a Modi led BJP government looks even more likely. Uh, I mean, its strength really rests on these four pillars. You know, the Hindutva, the Hindu nationalism, hyper nationalism, its welfare and development driven agenda, and and the Modi brand. And and the opposition have struggled to replicate these four factors. I think the government, uh, you know, Modi's approval rating uh, has been recently reported to be the, the highest among 22 world leaders. The BJP has an overwhelming funding advantage. And if, if they win, Modi will be the first prime minister since Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister, to secure three consecutive national elections. So not even Indira Gandhi, his daughter, was able to secure this. And we had flickering through that, our conversation earlier, mention of the economy, which is doing very well. And this is one thing that Modi's supporters point to, is saying, look, it's been very, very good for India's growth. Yeah, so one of the points that, that the BJP used to campaign on in state, uh, state elections, or one of the campaign slogans that they use, was double engine ki sarkar which essentially means that if, if you have the same party ruling at the state and national level, it's going to help to you know, strengthen growth and development in, in your state. So I think that that has been a very strong part of the narrative for the BJP. And Louise, I'm tantalized by your, your book on welfare. And welfare is one of the things that the BJP has really managed to crack in the sense of getting payments into people's, uh, I'm not going to say hands, but actually you know, onto their phones. Yes, this is in this is certainly part of the BJP's election machine and strategy is the very careful honing of direct benefit transfers and the use this of is money digital. from the government going never mind through a bank account has just arriving in people's phones 
here's the benefits you're always entitled to, thanks to the Modi government. Yes, although the opposition have also, opposition world governments are doing the same thing. And in fact, the yes. Congress... A very yeah, important yeah, point to yeah, remind us of. And much of the contest that goes on in these state elections is a competition for who gets the credit over these welfare schemes, which are being provided both by state governments and the national government. Where I did want to come in on the economy, though, was I think... So India, of course, bright spot in the global economy, fastest growing, emerging economy. What we don't have a very good handle on, and this is because of the suppression of, of statistical operations in India, are poverty rates. Um, we don't have recent poverty data and unemployment rates. And yet we know from survey after survey that these are the issues that matter most to voters. So if you ask voters going to the polls in these elections, what is the most important issue for you? It's jobs and it's inflation. It's cost of living pressures, right? And so there are structural issues facing the Indian economy, rising inequality, which are not at the moment being directly expressed through electoral politics, but they matter. And we mustn't lose sight of them in the bigger picture. That is a really important reminder. And Nishita, looking ahead to next year's elections, then what are the kind of factors you think are, are at play? And do you regard it as a, a, a certain outcome? Or do you think there really is quite a bit of unpredictability about it? No, uh, I don't see any unpredictability about it. I think I think Mr. Modi is going to come back. And I've been saying it for the past five years that there is absolutely no reason why he won't come back unless the opposition gets its um, act together and they have uh, failed uh, at it time and again. So it, it is actually a very, very dismal picture. Unless you, you like know, Modi. I, I do not come here as a as a supporter or a critic critique of Modi. But it, it, it's just that it, it, it is a very very, very um, dismal picture for any democracy that there is no credible uh, opposition. And when it comes to you know, uh, uh, what, what Louis says is, is absolutely correct. We are looking at a structural problem with the Indian economy and it, it, it is um, the issue of inequality that too much is concentrated in too few hands. If, if I could just add one caveat, so uh, and that is yeah. that the BJP does not have to lose for the opposition to win. So while the BJP is likely to win next year's election, it'll probably secure uh, over the 272-seat mark to form a government. It's still possible that it could win with a slightly weaker mandate. So, for instance, if it secures less than 300 seats, uh, that would potentially, to some extent, dent the Modi brand, make it more beholden to coalition partners. So I think that is probably the key mm. watch point. Whether they win or lose is not really the question. Is is whether they get that overwhelming mandate in the election, I think is going to be an important watch, watch point. So let's turn at this point to the second flank of our question and, and look at what uh, another term led by Narendra Modi would look like. Louise, what does that look like to you? Well, some of the answer to this will hinge on the answer to the question that Chittish has just framed for us. What does the election victory look like? And I think then the scenario, an emboldened BJP, which has seen a repeat of its 2019, the the scale of its 2019 victory, may go in for some very bold moves, which have the potential to even further reshape the fabric of Indian democracy, society. and and What kind of things are you thinking of? So I think there are two big big things that that we anticipate. The first is um, the rearrangement of parliamentary constituencies. India anticipates redrawing parliamentary constituencies by 2026. And this will update the allocation of seats that different states have in the Indian parliament from the currently used the 1971 population data. I won't go into the history as to why, but the consequence of redesigning parliamentary constituencies will be that northern states um, in the Hindi heartland, which are the, the BJP's core constituency, will increase in number. And the number of seats allocated to southern states, which tend to be governed by regional parties or the Congress party, will reduce in number. So the political consequences will be to harden a north-south fault line in Indian politics. This has profound potential consequences for for, for Indian federalism, questions around the redistributive fabric of Indian fiscal federalism at the moment. How much money the centre gives to different parts of the country and And which ones it it favours, if you like. And who pays the taxes that then are redistributed? So at the moment, you have southern richest states paying more in taxes, which are then redistributed to poorer northern states. We already know that that system is under has been under, under quite a lot of tension, but with delimitation on, on the anvil, those kinds of questions will become much, much more fiery. 
The other major social issue, which the BJP may move on, but we don't know yet, is the question of a uniform civil code. So this would be an attempt to create uniform personal laws in India. At the moment, different religious communities can operate their own personal laws for for marriage, for inheritance um, and divorce and so on. The uniform civil code has been one of the three big social questions that have been on the BJP's manifesto for election after election. It's the only one that hasn't yet been fulfilled. They have gone slow in recent months because of um, fears of opposition um, and concern amongst tribal constituencies, which are an important part of the BJP's electoral coalition. But I think an emboldened BJP after the Lok Sabha elections may go in for something big like this. So we don't know as yet, but I think um, you know, a Modi with a big mandate will want to do something bold. Nishta, are you concerned about these points? Well, of course, uh, everybody uh, with, with, a, with a thinking mind uh, needs to be concerned about these uh, eventualities. But let me talk about UCC first. The problem with the UCC... This is the Universal Civil Code that Louise has just beautifully yes, described for us. Yes, the, Thank you. So it is, uh, we do not have a draft yet. Mm. So we cannot even say whether uh, UCC comes from a place, you know, which is which is bona fide in nature or uh, that there is something cunning at play. By a bona fide place, you would mean the government saying something like, look, this this is this is simply going to unify the treatment of old Indians. And by and by cunning, you might mean, look, is it meant to discriminate against the minorities? Yes, yes. So there is the uh, uh, unless there is a draft on the on the table, we cannot ascribe any motive, whether bona fide or bona fide to the government. When it comes to delimitation, I think uh, Louis uh, summarized it very, very well that there is already a simmering tension. Why should the southern uh, states be punished for uh, good behavior? Why should they be subsidizing uh, for the northern states that have uh, fallen so badly behind on all possible social indices? Look at Bihar, look at Uttar Pradesh. Rajasthan has been moving up. So, you know, kudos to the governments, both the Congress Party and the BJP governments, because they have been pretty good at alleviating certain socio-economic issues. But a lot of the big technology engine that is driving India's economy, a lot of that is in the South. Mm. Absolutely. Chitaj, people talk a lot, particularly outside India, well, inside as well, about democratic backsliding and so on, that this is uh, India's democracy is not in good shape. And uh, there are many retorts to this. Where do you see this argument? So, I, I, yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, there's a degree of truth in these allegations, of democratic backsliding or the government pursuing authoritarianism by stealth. But, you know, if you look at the conduct of these state elections, they show that India's dem- democracy still remains quite vibrant. We've seen 11 state elections over the last 11 months. Voter turnout has been over 70 percent. We've seen fewer recounts, fewer allegations of vote rigging or manipulation. So I think, you know, democracy remains quite well entrenched in Indian society and it can't be overturned. And then one other, just one other point to add is India has become less liberal, but it's arguably become better governed. And, and I think the key point here is the issue of digital public infrastructure, which has helped to streamline welfare disbursements, access to health, education and banking services and reduce the space for corruption. I think this is another factor which has helped to get the, uh, the BJP reelected. Louise, how should we calibrate an answer to this question? Because you, you know, you hear a lot. I'm thinking of one very senior Indian businessman who said to me, "Oh, look, the rest of the world, democracies, and the BBC all exaggerate this question of of uh, the state of India's democracy, which is absolutely fine. What should we make sitting in a democracy outside India? What should we make of this?" Well, I mean, I think, you know, part of the answer to this has to involve introspection at at our side as well. Democracy is under pressure all over the world, right? And, you know, India's government uh, would push back very, well, does push back very strongly against, you know, organizations like Freedom House or VDEM, which are, you know, responsible for producing these, these global rankings of democracy to say, well, you know, you've kind of got it wrong and... We have, you know, had no attempt to thwart the outcome of an election in India, but look at what's happened, you know, what happens in the US and Brazil. I mean, you know, so as as Chitij says, you know, elections as a mechanism for garnering public opinion are still are still working and, and translated into election outcomes. Where I think we can't be deterred, however, though, from looking at the implications of what is happening in India's electoral electoral democracy for the quality of and, and robustness of India's institutional life. But, you know, if we look at the enormous pressure that has been placed on all manner of independent institutions, whether it's the courts, whether it's India's universities, where especially in the social sciences, there's been 
enormous restriction of academic freedom. Institutional you know, appointments across the board in India have become very heavily politicised. And, and there's, a, there's a wider cultural agenda at play here, which, which is changing um, the fabric of Indian institutional life and of Indian, uh, Indian society. So while I you know, have some degree of sympathy from, you know, about or at least understanding of the pushback that we receive from the Indian government about critiques of India's democratic backsliding, these are questions of profound importance for India's health as a thriving economy, as a, you know, as a place in which the rule of law thrives, you know, which, which we can't simply brush under the carpet. Just to add one point in terms of the response by the international community, I think ultimately we need to look at this through the lens of realpolitik or geopolitics as well. So uh, India's in- illiberal or imperfect democracy will, will ultimately trump China's one-party authoritarianism. So as long as India continues to be seen as a bulwark against the rise of China, concerns about democratic backsliding will, I think, continue to be downplayed in the West. And for that to really change, there would need to either be a significant surge in communal or uh, religious unrest within India, or a spillover of the Hindutva or Hindu nationalist agenda into the foreign policy domain. Those are all questions we're going to look at next year, which is the record bumper year of elections as far as anyone can count. Um, uh, I think 76, there may be more short-term ones, uh, I called it short-term notice as well, and um, maybe 40-something of those one would call very robust democracies, but the rest very much up for discussion. And we'll be discussing, you know, right through the year, and uh, our, in fact, in our final podcast of the year, some of those main points raised by it which Chitesh was just taking us into. We're going to have to stop there on this one, but obviously more to come on all this. A big thank you to my guests, Dr. Chitesh Bajpayee, Professor Louise Tillen, author and writer Nishto Gautam. Do follow them all on Twitter, and the links are in the show notes as usual. And a reminder that you can find all of our podcasts on Apple, Spotify, all major platforms, as well as through our social media. So do like, follow, subscribe. Do leave us a review. That's how I'll spend my Christmas reading them. 